Coming up next on Tech News Today, Google is hiring a bunch of people to train its artificial intelligence to recognize inaccurate information in search results. Also, Tag Heuer's new connected modular 45 Android Wear watch is really pricey. An iPhone that's an Android phone that's an iPhone. Also, Microsoft's Slack competitor called Teams launches for Office 365 users. And paying with your noggin is the future, according to Visa. All that and more coming up next on Tech News Today. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Today, episode 1724, recorded Tuesday, March 14th, 2017. This episode of Tech News Today is brought to you by Blue Apron, the number one fresh ingredient and recipe delivery service in the country. See what's on the menu this week and get three free meals with your first purchase and free shipping by going to blueapron.com slash TNT. And by Grasshopper. Stay connected and run your business from your mobile phone with Grasshopper. To save $50 on your order, visit trygrasshopper.com slash twit. Welcome to Tech News Today and happy Pi Day. Happy New Year. New Pi Year. <laughs> Although I can't get excited about Pi Days Why? since 2015 when it was like the actual Pi Day. What was different? Wait a minute. Okay, well, what am I missing? 3.1415. Oh. And then we celebrated on the hour. That's it was right. amazing. This is Tech News Today. We <laughs> talk about technology. I'm Megan Maroney. I'm Jason Howell. The problem with Pi Day is that it always makes me think of actual Pi and not, you know, the mathematical Pi. Mm, I hate Pi and I like actual Pi. You hate Pi? Actual Pi? I'm a cake person. Pie they, are is... not, they are not mutually exclusive. You can like both. No, because I think you're often given the choice between cake or pie, and I'll I don't take wanna, either. I don't, I don't like, uh, I don't like fruit in, um, you know, a dessert. Damn, I don't understand what's going on right now. Does no. that not look delicious, Megan? Nothing that like a cherry does pie. Does not look delicious. Give me a fork right now. I will eat that pie. <laughs> Uh, now, Me Ken's too. note in the chat room says he's never heard of Pi Day. It's P-I for Pi, 3.14, so it's March 14th, and then 1-5 was the next numbers, and that was, you know, two years ago, and I haven't, I, I can't. You haven't recovered. I haven't. And I that's where, there. this is where the streams cross, where it's an actual Pi uh, that celebrates Pi Day. Yeah. With right. the, the Pi symbol. Mm -hmm. uh, where's the Pi? Come on. Shall we get to it? If there's no pie, I think we must. Okay. Danny Sullivan from Search Engine Land says, Google is hiring 10,000 real human beings to work on the search algorithm and teach it to recognize offensive or factually wrong websites. A Google rep told Search Engine Land that they were avoiding the term fake news in favor of the phrase demonstrably inaccurate information, which is not nearly as catchy. The contract workers are called quality raiders and will mark racial slurs, graphic violence, and other upsetting content, not necessarily to remove it from search results, but rather to flag it and then teach the algorithm how to deal with content Content like it uh, during uh, in, in the future. So uh, nothing happens immediately to any of the content that's flagged. Um, Google's new guidelines also speak to people uh, who search with in, with in their minds already sort of searching for what I like to call fake news. So for example, if someone searches for evidence that the Holocaust never happened, mm -hmm. uh, they will also see factual information that in fact the Holocaust did happen. So they'll see that not just you know, these websites that talk about the Holocaust not happening. Um, and racial slurs won't be banned because of course, you know, people, this will help kids or people who are searching in a different language than their own. You know, if you, you I might be learning French or Spanish and I might think of a, uh, I heard a, someone use a phrase and I want to search to see what it means. And oh, you know, I'm not yeah. you know, using it as the racial slur, but as a piece of information to um, make sure I don't use that in that language. It's tricky, right? I mean, it, like, this is a search engine. We always think of search engines as being the place you go to find information, um, be it accurate or inaccurate information. It all exists there. Snopes is a site that, that debunks, and that's what we expect out of Snopes. Do we expect that out of Google? I, which, and I'm not saying we do or we don't, but I think it's, 
you don't always know the intention behind a search. You know what I mean? And it does seem like Google is attempting to kind of uh, pull pull out the really uh, the really uh, you know not inaccurate stuff. Uh, while still kind of paying attention to the idea that sometimes people search for controversial things, but it's okay to show the result for that. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Like the the one example is the Obama Pledge of, the, of Allegiance. Uh, you know, if you do a search for Obama Pledge of Allegiance, at one time the top result would have been, you know, it, like a fake news site or whatever, confirming, in air quotes, that, that, that Obama wanted to get rid of the Pledge the Pledge of Allegiance. Now you, that would actually be overtaken by articles that actually prove, like like they're making a statement in doing this. And I'm not saying that it's wrong. I'm just, it, it kind of goes counter in some ways to what I feel like a lot of people think of when they think, think of a search engine. They think of a search engine as being a, as a place where if I want to find the answer to this thing, or if I want to find, or if I want to find something that touches on this thing, whether it's accurate or inaccurate, that might be what I'm actually searching for. So you wouldn't, no. you would, I always use a search engine to find the most accurate information. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I do too, but sometimes, <laughs> sometimes what if, what if I sometime wanted to go on Google and I knew that I was searching for inaccurate information, but I wanted to find it to help me write a story. Right. Like you wanted to look for all the people who are denying the Holocaust. Yeah. So for, you want to see what you want example. to go to their websites and you can absolutely do that, but just it's not going to be deeper. the first. Yeah. And I don't yeah. even think they're not removing anything. Right. Um, you know, they're just flagging it and teaching the algorithm how to deal with it. And, you know, they're not, they haven't really said specifically. Right. But yeah. yeah, I mean, and again, this gets back to the like, like is it our responsibility to, um, you know, to sort out what's fake and what's not? Or is it Google's or is it Facebook's responsibility? And I, of course, think that, you know, it's personal responsibility, but that's hard. And I think that if they're using an algorithm and humans mm -hmm. to try to uh, suss out what is most accurate and bring that to the top so that if someone's just looking, right. um, you know, I don't ever want someone to look about, you know, Holocaust, to, to look up Holocaust deniers and go to Google and say, there's no such thing. The Holocaust right. deniers the don't exist. The is, is, you know, you know like, denying. Yeah, because that, that is the yeah. truth that exists. Those right. people exist. Um, so I think that they, I trust that their algorithm and their human beings that they've hired. Uh, a lot of human beings this. that they've hired to train this algorithm, right? Yeah. It takes a lot of people to train an algorithm, apparently. <laughs> apparently. <laughs> it only takes one algorithm to train a lot of people. Uh, weird how that works. Uh, there's a new luxury smartwatch in town. Tag Heuer announced its new Android Wear watch, the Connected Modular 45. And like its name implies, it's a modular system with 56 total designs, up to four, uh, sorry, up to 500 design combinations. Tag says it made extra effort to build the watch the way it builds its other luxury mechanical watches with the, mo the modular design that you see here. The consumer can actually swap the connected module out for mechanical module. So and that'll, you know, hopefully long term increase the longevity of the timepiece. Uh, but it comes at a cost sixteen hundred dollars. <laughs> That's one hundred dollar more. $100 more than its previous smartwatch from 2015, the Tag Heuer Connected, which I thought was actually a pretty nice watch. No doubt, well, A, it's round, so we know Megan doesn't like it. Uh, but B, I mean, it's it's a thick, chunky timepiece. You know, this is, a, this is a beast of a timepiece. Um, don't get me wrong. It's a beautiful watch. The mechanical, uh, I'm all for mechanical round watches, just the, smart. just the smart. So just watch. buy wow. the mechanical okay. part. I do like that about it though, that like when we all decide having glass, um, you know, screen smartwatches is idiotic and we go back to the way watches have always been, then you can do that. Yeah. You just I know. You know, fit it back in. I think it's a pretty smart, smart way to go about it. Smart um, way to go about the future dumb watch. <laughs> exactly. Well, and I think, a couple of years ago when they did the first connected watch, they had some sort of a plan to where at some point you could, I think you could upgrade from their watch to one of their regular watches. So in both of these releases, Tag Heuer has, has recognized that a smartwatch as a timepiece, as a long term, like year, you know, generations upon generations passed down from generations. You're probably not going to do that with a smartwatch mm -hmm. because there's just, you know, the technology is is bested so quickly and uh you know it's just not going to survive that long so I at least they know. recognize that i mean my first apple watch i kept it for like almost 18 months 
<laughs> Man, did you pass that down from generation to generation? Uh, yeah, I don't know. No. Somebody, somebody has to? it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows if it's if it's still even working at this point? Um, one thing I found interesting is that Intel apparently is working on an assistant of its own. Uh, to integrate into the device, even though this is an Android Wear 2.0 device that has Assistant built into it, Intel's like, well, we're going to put our own there. It'll be context aware. So like you leave from work and it shows you different things on your watch as a, a result of that. Uh, it'll have follow up question, contextual awareness for conversations and stuff uh, for asking questions. I don't know how they both exist on the same watch. It's not on there yet, but they're going to roll it out at some point. Yeah, there are too many assistants. Yeah. Like Samsung has their Bixby, is that what it's called? Mm -hmm. Like their their smart that assistants they're, that they're supposedly going to have, yeah, yeah on Too their many. upcoming phone. Too many assistants. We need assistance. Yeah, we need assistance for the assistants now. Mm -hmm. yeah. True. Volvo just announced their newest electric car, and it's taking on Tesla with an affordable starting price of between thirty-five thousand dollars and forty thousand dollars. Also has a range of two hundred and fifty miles. Mike Murphy from Quartz says that we're still not sure about the look of the new car or whether or not it'll be a variant of an existing Volvo model. But we should be able to drive one by 2019. And I am not holding my breath for that date. The Chevy Bolt was promised last fall. It's still only available in lim limited areas. Uh, the Model 3, Tesla's Model 3, obviously, if you want it now, good luck to you. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I am all for the electric cars. And I, I understand that 35000 to 40000 is is the lower end for an electric car. That still seems like a lot to me. Um, but, yeah, it uh, it's Volvo is a trusted brand. Yeah, I would say so. This and actually uh, 35 to 40,000 is kind of on the lower end for Volvo's cars, mm -hmm. not considering electric. So it's kind of on par for kind of the price range for the introductory uh, models of some of their vehicles. It didn't really say which vehicle this was going to be, but uh, some concepts that they've released uh, kind of in this in this vein show that it might be a small SUV of some sort that would compete with the Tesla Model Y or a sedan that could be compete with the the Model 3 but now the Tesla Model Y that's the future cheaper yeah. SUV mm -hmm. exactly mm. so I you know I don't know if that's exactly what they're going to end up with uh, once they you know announce more information on this but I mean Volvo has said they have a, a pretty big goal of a million electric cars by 2025. So this would help them at least pave that path. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Also, I mean, Tesla really is more, um, you know, on the brink. Like they're the ones that really have to make it with the Model right. 3. Like Volvo, like they have a bunch of cars that have been around forever. If this works great, if not, you know, it's not a big deal. Tesla's all in. Yes. Like it has to work for yes. Tesla. Absolutely. Uh, continuing on the wearable beat uh, from my earlier wearable story, Visa introduced a new wearable that might make your beach combing a bit less cum cumbersome. Visa launched a new pilot program coinciding with the World Surf League's 2017 Quicksilver and Roxy Pro Gold Coast competition that will allow a special prototype pair of sunglasses to act as someone's digital wallet. An embedded NFC chip lives in the arms of the sunglasses that negotiates the payment when tapped to a supporting terminal. Sunglasses need to be removed in order to pay, which is a bummer because I really like the idea of transactional headbutting. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> anyways, you know, what do you think? Sunglasses that pay pay for your meal. Uh, I think this is the kind of stuff we're missing at South by Southwest. And I cannot believe Leo has not paid for us to go to Austin and cover this uh, sunglasses wearable uh, market. <laughs> Uh, because it's ridiculous, totally. I just say what I think about this is no, <laughs> no, no, no. And I, I know that they're really just demonstrating yeah. that a payment chip can be put in anything. And they knew that like putting it in glasses will get headlines. People on technology podcasts will talk about it. So I get Good thing it. we didn't talk about yeah, it. I know, we didn't fall it. for totally that old trick. Uh, but <laughs> yeah, I, I, first of all, I buy things at night and I never want to see people wearing sunglasses at night. Oh, okay. You don't wear your sunglasses at the, in the dark? Don't. Wear my sunglasses. So you at can, night. so you can. No. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, they're they're obviously just testing this. They, they're also very curious that they can get brands and banks on board for sponsoring the technology. I have a feeling it's probably not going to go very far, but hey, you never know. Snapchat has its spectacles, and that seems to have worked out okay for them. Maybe what Snapchat needs to do is embed an NFC tag into the spectacles, the next uh, release of the spectacles, and uh, that's like the perfect combination. Visa and, and Snap. Mm -hmm. I, I thought about that too, but I what I'm really more interested in this idea that you brought up earlier of transactional headbutting. It's a thing. I don't think it is a thing. No, it isn't actually, <laughs> okay. but it should be. Okay. <laughs> All right.
<laughs> well, if you are on the East Coast and snowbound, we are thinking of you. Stay safe, stay inside, watch every episode of TNT twice. And if you need a snowplow, there is an app for that. CNN Tech reports that plows and mows, both with a Z, will give you a quote through the app or online, and you will get a notification when the driver of the snowplow is on the way. And you can bet your bottom dollar there will be surge pricing. CNN says expect to pay $50 or more, or more during this winter storm, Stella. Uh, so I, I like this idea for mowing. It also, they also do mowing. That's for the mows. Because uh, I, don't, I don't think we'll need the plows. But I definitely would like somebody to mows for me. Uh, it's, there's 1,500 on-demand snow plows right now in some cities. And it's a great idea because sometimes, uh, apparently, so I've read from people who live in snowy places, you can't usually get um, plowers on the horn in emergencies because they're out plowing. They're out plowing. They're, they're busy. Mm -hmm. You know, they're they're clearing all that snow. Um, yeah, apparently this, you know, these are drivers, plowers on their usual routes, you know, kind of signed up here so that when they get the call, they can just kind of fill those jobs on demand in between the things they're already doing. And uh, so that they can they can fill their time that way. It's the uberfication uberfication mm -hmm. of the world. Yeah, essentially. I don't think they all would. All the little things. Yeah, I mean maybe it's it's March already, so February is really Uber's bad month. So now maybe people are still ready to say it's like Uber for snowplow, but <laughs> you know probably you're better off saying it's like Lyft for snowplow. I think it should be SaaS, which is snow blowers as a service. Snow. Really Where's the B? Sabas. No, well, I, I thought I just. <laughs> Snow. Mm. Uh, well, I, I, I just Sabbath. saw snowblowers as one word. Oh, okay. Snowblowers. snowblowers. One word. I don't okay. know if it actually is, but it that's, works for SAS. That's how little I understand snow. I don't even know if snowblower is one <laughs> word or two. Microsoft is finally launching its Slack competitor called Teams. We'll talk to Microsoft expert Brad Sams in a minute. But first, let's take some time to thank Blue Apron, the sponsor of this episode. Blue Apron is the number one fresh ingredient and recipe delivery service in the country. Blue Apron's mission is to make incredible home cooking accessible to everyone. Blue Apron delivers seasonal recipes along with fresh, high-quality ingredients to make delicious home-cooked meals for less than $10 per person. Every meal comes with a step-by-step, easy-to-follow recipe card and pre-portioned ingredients that can be prepared in 40 minutes or less. Not all ingredients are created equal, so it's important to know where your food came from. I just got the email that my Blue Apron box is on the way. I am thrilled because I do not have time to shop and cook tonight. And in fact, I will not even cook it. My husband will cook it because uh, he's better at that than me. I don't, Lucky. even though these are super easy directions, I always miss something, but he doesn't and I get to eat it and it's delicious. Blue Apron sets the highest quality standards for their community of over 150 local farms, fisheries, and ranchers across the United States. Seafood is sourced sustainably, beef, Chicken and pork comes from responsibly raised animals, and the produce is sourced from farms that practice regenerative farming. Now, by shipping the exact amount of each ingredient required for a recipe, Blue Apron is reducing food waste. This is great because we are moving and we have looked through our cabinets and we have a billion bottles of like that I use for different recipes to different kinds of vinegar, not Blue Apron meals, but regular meals I tried to cook myself. They're, you know, just, I used them once and then I shoved them in the back of the closet and now they're three years uh, out of date. And they're I had to just throw them at this away. Point. Mm -hmm. Their freshness guarantee promises that every ingredient in your delivery arrives ready to cook or they will make it right. Blue Apron delivers to 99% of the continental United States. There's no weekly commitment, so you can get deliveries when you want them. Customize your recipes every week based on your dietary preferences. Choose from a variety of new recipes each week or let Blue Apron's culinary team surprise you. It's great to get a surprise in the mail. Recipes are not repeated within a year, so you'll never get bored. Here's an example of what you will get from Blue Apron. Salmon piccata with orzo and broccoli pork chops and miso butter with bok choy and marinated apple, vegetable chili and baked sweet potatoes with crispy tortilla strips, spicy shrimp coconut curry with cabbage and rice. Check out this week's menu and get three meals free with your first purchase and get free shipping by going to blueapron.com slash TNT. You'll love how good it feels and tastes to create incredible home cooked meals with Blue Apron. Don't wait, go to blueapron.com slash TNT. Blue Apron, a better way to cook. 
All right. Just last week, Google rolled out its big Slack competitor app. And today, Microsoft officially launched Team, its collaboration service for Office 365 customers. Joining us to talk about it is Brad Sams from Petri.com. Is it so we were talking about this before? Is it Petri or Petri? It's it's it always is, uh, the question. It is Petri. Petri. So Oh man, that's that's a hard you know, one to it, remember. You can't lose either way. Okay, so. good. Well, either way, it's spelled the same. Dot com. Go there. Uh, so first things first. Thanks for uh, joining us today to talk about this. Uh, Microsoft ran a limited preview of Teams since last November. What was the feedback that you had heard along that along that time uh, leading up to today's release? So really, really interesting stuff here. Um, and I would say roughly January of this year. Uh, I kind of got deep into this, and I actually talked to about 40 different people talking at, uh, at different organizations. That's 40 different companies who are in the process of, of using Teams, rolling it out, and all that stuff. And universally, everybody was saying, you know what? This is good enough that we could replace Slack. Uh, there were, it, It's not perfect, and Slack still has significant advantages in other areas. But the, the feedback we were hearing was, if a company has Office 365 deployed, there's really no reason for them to keep paying for a separate product uh, like Slack when Teams is going to be included into that platform. So Microsoft actually, I think, uh, they've got something here. And they built this all in-house. And if you go back to, I think it was uh, 2013, roughly when Slack was announced, everyone's like, all right, Microsoft is going to buy these guys because it was huge. I remember it was that. really, really big with the startup community, small businesses. People loved it. And I want to say it was around June of last year, Microsoft said, you know what, we're not going to buy them. They want too much money. We're going to build this ourselves. And that's uh, what Teams has become. I know that when, you know one question that people have been asking is, is Microsoft late to the game? I mean, you know, if, if it was two years ago that Slack burst onto the scene and now everybody's doing it, there's, there's a lot of competition right now. But this is really, I mean... You know, there's no doubt about it. Microsoft in the enterprise has a lot of support, and this is just kind of folded into Office 360. That gives Microsoft a huge advantage just by sheer user numbers, right? Sure. Yep. And so I, I think that's a very fair statement. Microsoft gets a lot of flack for being late. Mobile, it, specifically, they were so late that they completely missed the boat. I don't think this is quite the same thing. I mean, for example, look, Google just kind of announced their Slack competitor last week. Uh, we see Amazon starting to play in this arena, not fully yet with Chime. And so now we have Microsoft formally launching Teams. And the one thing that we all know about the enterprises is, is that it's very slow moving. So when these things kind of show up, Microsoft actually has the luxury because of their position. They can kind of sit and wait and say, hey, is this is this just a fad or is this really something? And once they saw it becoming really something, uh, they have the cash flow and capacity to say, OK, you know what? We're going to take this many engineers. We're going to throw them into this product, make sure it's good and then and then kick it out the door. So I don't know if they were necessarily late. They're obviously not first. We know that for for a fact, um, but we know sometimes the leaders get stabbed in the back because they they forge the path. But then here comes Microsoft, and you know with their their capacity and really Microsoft's Office 365, you can't undercut how much power that has inside the corporate environment. So one of the things that I love most about Slack is how it works over mobile of any any of my devices on my iPad on my iPhone. Mm -hmm. Um, will Teams also work on iOS as seamlessly? Yes, they have a full suite of apps uh, supporting all of the major platforms. Uh, that was almost that's a requirement these days, especially in the corporate world. There's no way they could have just launched a desktop application. Be like, you know what, mobile apps are coming soon. Like that doesn't fly anymore, especially with Nadella saying, you know what, we're mobile first, cloud first. And this kind of embodies that. So you have a full suite of apps on every different platform and everything that will go with you. The one thing that um, that we're hearing a lot from the market is that, and honestly, this is a third party opportunity. If somebody can come up with a way to export Slack content and ingest it into Teams, they will make a lot of money very quickly. That's the big sore point at this point is if, you ha if you're invested in Slack, you have all that historical knowledge, um, especially if employees have come and gone, and you can't readily port that over to Teams, which is a pretty big downer for the platform right now for people who are invested heavily into Slack. Yeah, it's a huge lock-in. Um, good right. for Slack at the short term, though, to <laughs> keep people over there. I, they, you know, Slack also has the benefit of having a free tier, which, sure. I mean, with Teams, there is no free tier, right? Like, you have to be an Office 365 subscriber. 
Yeah, so Microsoft will give you this nice runaround and say, well, technically we do have a free tier, but they don't. You're absolutely right. Uh, you can get a free trial of Office 365, which they then say, hey, you can use that to go try out Teams. But it's not, it's nothing like what Slack is offering, where you can get, uh, you know, you can get your company up and running on a free tier and then upgrade them to the the premium product. It's not so easy in the Office environment. And this again goes back to Microsoft's just kind of. They really, I don't want to say they fully own this place because Google's G Suite is is doing really good stuff and they, they showcased mm-hmm. that last week. Uh, but Microsoft knows that people are buying Office 365, over 85 million active corporate users. They're not really hurting for that. And so what they're trying to do is get those people further entrenched into Office so that they can't leave. Mm-hmm. So you know, one of the things about uh, the Google, what they announced the with the Hangouts Meet and Hangouts mm-hmm. Chat, like they seem to really promise this seamless, you know, you're chatting with someone and all of a sudden it becomes clear and whatever your work thing you're talking about that you need to talk face to face or, or sure. audio. Uh, is Does Teams have something that's that seamless that you can transfer between audio conferencing, video conferencing and chat? Yep, they absolutely do. Uh, one of the interesting things about Teams is that if and we and this is a pipe dream for all of us is that if you could get your entire company in using teams you could effectively actually get rid of skype and email it's it's that comprehensive so what you can do inside of teams is you can actually just click on someone's name click the little video button and you're having an instant uh, video chat you can set up meetings that people can come pop in and out of uh microsoft and myself i give microsoft a lot of um crap for pushing out bad products and bad updates and stuff all the time. Teams is honestly not one of those things. This is a very well thought out, a very well tested, um, and Microsoft put some of their best people on this stuff. This isn't something that they just spun up because they felt like they needed. They truly invested a lot of uh, corporate IP and heads into this product to make sure that it was top notch when it launched. So besides the lack of a free version, is there anything you didn't like about it? Come on, Brad, there must be something you didn't like about it. (laughs) Certainly, certainly. So there's a couple issues. First off, there's no guest access right now. So Slack is very good that if you have a group and you have a a third-party contractor, you can bring them into the Slack channel and give them permissions. That doesn't exist. Microsoft says that is coming. They're hopefully targeting in June. So that's not perfect. Uh, The other thing, too, about this is for a lot of people, there's going to be... If you don't get your whole company using it or your whole team using Teams, it it really falls apart. Because if you have people holding uh, conversations in email and some in Teams, it the whole product doesn't work. So this is one of those things that you're either all in on it or you're going to have a really bad experience. So um, it, that's 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 the real challenge with this up and coming product. Um, what uh, what about third party integration? So we know that you know Microsoft has really tightly integrated its own services, obviously yep. into this, which is what you would expect and what you would hope for. Uh, but they're also kind of working with a lot of third parties to to bring in that functionality, like we have seen in other products like Slack. What about yep? Those? So there is a third party uh, ecosystem, um, and it allows you to bring in things like task management, and they have their own little area. There's also bots. Uh, this product has been in development for roughly eighteen. Ish months. So this is, they've really thought this all the way through. It be, actually began private testing, I want to say back in August of last year. And so there is a wide developer ecosystem that allows you to do the plugins, the pooling content, uh, specifically like I was testing out task management because we use Basecamp at our company. And I was thinking, man, could we truly get off of Basecamp and go into Teams? It's not, it's not quite there yet with the task management and task distribution. Uh, but yeah, third-party support is there and that ecosystem is slowly, slowly materializing. Can I send GIFs? Yes, it actually, they they tie in with uh, Jiffy. So okay. they, they tie in through that. And um, I love I mean, it. Yeah. That's critical. Sign me in up. In this day and age. That and, and, and yeah. And, it really uh, is. They even went as far as you can create custom Steve. memes. So you can, you can pull up an image uh, and write your own text all within Teams. They put a lot of effort into making sure that the millennial demographic would be very happy with uh, <laughs> that part of the engagement. <laughs> right on. Uh, Brad Sams, uh, it's a pleasure getting you back on. Thank you so much for uh, taking some time to tell us a little bit tonight about uh, Microsoft's big deal. We really appreciate, appreciate it. Appreciate it. Thanks, guys. That's Petri, not Petri, Petri.com, P-E-T-R-I.com. <laughs> Thanks again, Brad. Thank you. <laughs> we'll talk to you soon. 
So I dug deep. I dug deep into the mailbag for a message from Matt about our segment that we did back in January on how to leave Facebook. Matt writes, I applaud Jason's decision to finally leave Facebook. As someone who left Facebook several years ago due to various reasons, hateful political postings, receiving death, thre death threats, overall waste of time, oh I can definitely tell Jason that life without Facebook is far better than life with Facebook. I finally deleted my Twitter account a few weeks ago. I deleted my abandoned Google Plus account a few months ago, and I have systematically over over the years, gone through and deleted my various other social media accounts. Is there anything I miss about social media? No, says Matt. I would hope so after all of that deleting. <laughs> I mean, that's the that's the nuclear option, right? And I, I don't know if everyone is at that point. I So I should, I should clarify, I did not leave Facebook. I mean, I, I stepped away from Facebook. I still have a Facebook account. I have not logged in since the beginning of December. And like, I'm still, I'm still kind of like formulating my thoughts around it. I really mm -hmm. want to write something up because I get asked about it a lot from like my friends and family mm -hmm. because there's really like, yes, the, on, on one, on one level, it's nice because there were a, there were a lot of like kind of creeping kind of issues and, and threads that just were bumming me out every time I logged into Facebook and stepping away allows me to not necessarily see some of that. And I'm sure it's changed a lot in the past three months. Like, that's one thing that I think is like, it has Facebook changed, changed in no. the last three months? Stepping up? No. But then at the same time, like, you really have to work very hard to maintain the same kind of relationship with the people that you've been grown so used to communicating with through Facebook. And that's not easy. That seems like it's, it's easy, but, you know... We're, we're busy lives. Facebook is like a universal, almost a universal tool where everybody just happens to be. And in a casual sense, you end up commenting with your friends that you hardly ever see in reality. You step away from that and it's, you have to make a concerted effort to reach out and connect in a way that we used to, mm -hmm. that we don't as much anymore because of social media. You know? It's true. I've also posted all kinds of crazy things on your wall. You would cool. not believe it. The next time. <laughs> <laughs> and I would not deny. I would not deny that that you did. Uh, I would not doubt it. Um, yeah, it'll be interesting when I finally decide to log back in to kind of see. I'm 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 now at the point to where I've been away long enough that it's just easier for me to continue not mm -hmm. returning. And I don't I don't want to return until I like feel like I, until I really understand why I'm going back and what how I want to use it. And not just mindlessly scroll, which mm -hmm. is the point that I got to at the at the time where I said, you know what, my time can be spent better than just sitting here scrolling for hours. Mm -hmm. I need to step away. Uh, thanks for writing that a couple of months ago. Matt. Sorry, sorry we didn't throw that in the show, but <laughs> good good stuff. Up next, the perfect phone case for the indecisive among us. But first, let's take a minute to thank Grasshopper. A sponsor of this episode. Uh, Grasshopper is a virtual phone system and it's designed for entrepreneurs. It's going to make you even better with your business and managing all this stuff around your phone uh, with your, with your uh, business. Grasshopper works just like a traditional phone system, but it requires no hardware purchase. With our iOS and Android app, callers can reach you wherever you are on the mobile phone you already have. Grasshopper allows you to keep your existing number so you can maintain your brand. And then when you make a call, of course, your client is going to see your Grasshopper caller ID instead of your personal phone number, even though you're calling from the same phone. Simply select a toll-free or a local number. You can record a custom greeting, add multiple extensions for your business. Uh, toll-free numbers, of course, awesome for marketing. Uh, makes your business sound more professional. You can set up department and employee extensions with custom call forwarding to any phone in the world. You can get voicemails emailed to you as audio attachments if you prefer to get them that way. Uh, you can also send and receive SMS text messages from your business number. Join the over 250,000 Grasshopper customers today. Plans start at just $12 per month and you have a 30-day money-back guarantee. Turn your smartphone into a business line with Grasshopper. To save $50 on your order, go to trygrasshopper.com slash twit. That's trygrasshopper.com slash twit. And we thank Grasshopper for their support. TNT's fan of the day is Trent Moody. He's a regular here, actually. He's sent in a few things over the, over the last few months. Who sent us this video saying, I get bored sometimes, so I watch TNT and put Snapchat filters on people. Like Megan, uh, making Megan emo... 
with Snapchat. <laughs> that's that's the emo filter. That right? is amazing. Have you already played around with the emo filter? Uh, I I there's so many. They change them every day. I I did play with one that ga- also gave me a nose ring, not just the black lipstick. But and I think like, the black lipstick would look pretty good. Yeah. Were you like, hmm, maybe I should do that? Yeah. I was actually, I always think that when I use Snapchat filters, I think I'm not good enough the way I am. I need to change. I, I know when, <laughs> when I saw your uh, Snapchat filter of me with a puppy on my head, mm-hmm. I thought, maybe I should do that. Mm-hmm. Maybe I should get a puppy and put it on my head. Yeah, absolutely. You should. Yeah. I think so. Yeah, I, I personally. it was a good look. Show us how you watch or listen to TNT. Just record a video or take a picture of yourself or your setup. Post it on Instagram, Google+, Plus, Twitter, or Facebook and use the hashtag How I Watch TNT. And we'll find it. Before we get to the last story, Burke uh, has oh, you had something to say. Burke. Something. Burke had something to chat in. Emo <laughs> for the win. Burke is so emo. <laughs> yeah, he really, he wears black lipstick around here. He and just he, has a filter that he uh, takes it off. <laughs> and he never smiles. So, you know, we haven't talked about Kickstarters in a while. We rarely talk about them because, you know, they might ever not ever be something. But we do talk about them when they're so bizarre that they begin to come all the way around and make sense. This is the case with the eye. It's an iPhone case, which is actually an Android phone. It costs $189. It's raised $100,000 on Kickstarter. Uh, it also charges your iPhone, which just for that, I mean... That alone, it charges your iPhone battery from the Android battery. It's like a leech. It's taking yeah. power from the Android device and giving it to the iPhone. I do not approve. Yeah. You don't, don't approve? Remove, don't depower the Android device. It's humiliating for the Android device. Oh, really? You find it humiliating? No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> of course somebody did this. Of course someone made this. And by the way, apparently a lot of people want it. 1,171 backers. Mm-hmm. $95,000 goal. It's at 161000 with 31 days to go. So apparently a lot of iPhone users want Android. That's yeah. how I interpret this. I've always wanted just a phone on the back of another phone. Just <laughs> really, I don't really care what it is. But yeah, I mean, next time we switch, we should do that. We should get this case. Oh, and wow. That would be a weird experiment. Yeah. What I, what I don't understand is, so apparently it shares the speaker, the mic, and the camera of the iPhone with the Android device. I don't know. It, it, my, it doesn't compute for me. Mm. It makes my brain hurt a little bit trying well, to understand how, yeah. how they're able to, to share like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, oh, Burke, that's a really good point. Though I hate to say, I hate to agree. Uh, it's to prevent iPhones from being stolen, says Burke. Probably need a rim shot for that one. Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. um, I don't even know if there's one in that pro- profile, but there you go. Uh, $189, too much, too little. For an for a phone case, I mean, I think the battery backup, like the the one with the Apple bump, I think that's like one hundred and fifty dollars or something. So you might as well have a phone yeah. in there too. You might as well have an Android phone on the back, especially yeah, if you're like you want to get some more viruses on your mobile device. No, <laughs> you want to be able to not contact your friends road. on iMessage or uh, what else? Whatever. <laughs> yeah, maybe that's that's it right there. If you like Android but you want iMessage, you just mm-hmm. get an iPhone right. and one of these. Yes. There you go. Yeah, exactly. Now you're an Android user with iMessage. Mm-hmm. That's it. Ships to backers uh, by August or September. So if you get one, let us know how it goes. TNT records live every Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern, 2300 UTC at twit.tv slash live. You can be part of the show by emailing us at tnt at twit.tv. Leave us a short voicemail to 60TNT show and find us on Twitter at Tech News Today TV. Hey, subscribe to the show. Subscribe for your friends. Go to twit.tv slash TNT and come see us. We love having a live audience. Email tickets at twit.tv. And if you want to tweet at me uh, to tell me why you might or might not want an Android phone on the back of your iPhone, like a battery sandwich, sort of. <laughs> I met of. Megan Maroney. Kind of. Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> uh, I'm Jason Howell on Twitter. Thanks to our technical director, Brian Burnett. Thanks to Burke for helping out in the studio. And for the occasional uh, words and thumbs up, thanks to Kevin for editing the show. And thanks to you for talking tech with us today. We'll see you all tomorrow. Bye, everybody. Woo-hoo.